Today, I'd like you to listen in on, on one verse in particular, the second half of verse 14. And he had compassion for them and cured their sick. I'd like for us, as you hear this, to expand the image of sickness beyond physical sickness. Is to see the sickness that pervades our being today. The sicknesses that are ever part of us. And through that lens, we begin to find healing. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from their towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and an hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they replied, he had nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said to them, bring them here to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and two fish. He looked up to heaven blessed and broke the loaves and gave it to them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled and they looked up what was left over in broken pieces 12 baskets full Jesus is up to something as his retreat in his fishing boat to a deserted spot signals he is deep in prayerful thought. He leaves his disciples and ventures out into the waters to a spot of solitude and seclusion. What is there for Jesus alone in this secluded lake spot? He takes time for prayer and reflection before reemerging from solitude to face what is next. Prayer and quiet time, his centering time before moving forward. Jesus is so in tune and in touch so connected to self and to others that he seems to walk into situations prepared even for the unexpected, equipped to see what is there and reach out and meet and confront, soothe and care. So as his borrowed fishing boat that has a few leaks reaches the shore, he shakes the water off his feet and goes toward them. They are waiting for him, the crowd, Jesus, ready and willing to lean into difficult situations and story, creating meaningful encounters that express God in their midst, God in tune and in tandem with their illness and pain. Jesus' willingness to confront and console guides his path, moving forward with a graceful spirit of hope. The whiplash that Jesus experienced from solitude to the many that need his attention create a sharp contrast isolation to the multitude. There is no security detail holding back the crowds as they reach for him. Their eyes tell their story of their sickness, their longing to be counted or even seen as human beings, let alone accepted as a loved and beloved child of God. And Jesus sees them. Jesus knows them. This human and divine Jesus knows firsthand what he is doing to cause a scene that will be costly. And for him, there is no concern. He jumps out of his little rented boat and meets them with compassion and he cures their sickness. What is their sickness? What could a multitude be facing or dealing with? It is what Jesus knows so well. Jesus doesn't see the number of people. Jesus sees the person, the woman, the child, the broken down, the torn and beaten, the one that is followed as suspicious in the city square, the one whose number is never called and always remains at the back of the line, the one who works the same amount of hours as the other and receives less in wages, the one that doesn't have the features or a dialect to be seen in religious or political structures. Jesus sees the individual and cures the sickness an image, a 
an imposed image that he cures of being less than or not enough. For Jesus in this moment is filled with compassion and sees the pain and suffering, the daily pain and suffering that is there, and his action is to heal and to console. Jesus doesn't look at the numbers. Jesus isn't working to reach for a selfie to post and share. Jesus isn't reaching for a quota or a marker that are keys to his success. He is not looking for ratings and acceptance. Jesus is all into the stories of those who came to be cured, to be told, you are loved by your creator, God, the great I am, the one who led you out of captivity, who heard your cry after countless generations of suffering. No matter what the group on the other side of the water says, I am saying and sharing something different, a message of hope and reconciliation because I see your suffering and my way shows you a new way forward that connects you to a God with a disconnected society that doesn't value and embrace your humanity. As Jesus continues to show compassion to their suffering and find ways through words and actions to comfort and console and to heal, the crowd lingers with Jesus. They listen and watch one another as their collective story unfolds and they find a great unity. And in those arms of Jesus, they find an invitation to be recognized as fully human, not looked at through the lenses of power. They find a comforting peace and a great release from being in community with Jesus. And as every story goes, all good things must come to an end. The faithful disciples say to Jesus, it's time to wrap this show up, Jesus. Let's call it a day. You've done a good thing, Jesus as if the work of Jesus has a specific start and end time. Numbers look good, people are pleased. Look, it's all in a day's work and you know what? We're kind of hungry, so let's get out of here. We get high ratings for compassion today, Jesus. Now let's close this show down and move this scene along quickly. For Jesus, his compassion was to heal their suffering. And for Jesus, that meant staying put. Jesus keeps on going as if to say to the well-meaning disciples, you don't get it. This isn't about numbers and good press releases. This isn't about getting your fill and feeling good about yourself and what you have done. Their response to Jesus, we've been here all day. Can't they just appreciate what we've done for them? Their echoes of pity ring through the air. Jesus says, not yet. Jesus was in tune with the systems of oppression and how they worked, and he meant to change that, that equality is costly work. Systems of power from Herod's political system to the religious order of the day, they were not about to change, certainly not for a healing human and divine Jesus from Nazareth, the one who found what was lost, the individual who their tears found a new release. They were hungry and were fed. For Jesus, this was all about feeding people that are hungry in spirit and body. And so Jesus puts a halt to the disciples' eagerness to leave. These new friends are in need of food. You need to feed them. Jesus instructs the disciples that it is their responsibility to be co-creators and feed those that are suffering. Their response to Jesus, there simply isn't enough food to feed the multitudes. This crowd is too big. Look, one, two, three, four, 1,500, 3,000, 5,000. The number crunching disciples calculated that there, isn't, there wasn't a way to feed everyone. And so Jesus says, hand over what you have. Five loaves and two fish. Just as God provided manna in the wilderness for the wandering, so too would Jesus find a way. And he did. And they ate and were filled. Jesus must have lingered a bit 
He looked around at the people and was filled, not drained, inspired as he conspired to tell a different story to an upset, to upset a quieted secret that all were deserving of compassion that day for body and soul. They were filled as they feasted from the bread of life, the body and heart of Jesus, the hands and feet of God. The Gospels are always speaking, providing a way to see an invitation to meet Jesus. The feeding of the multitude is a miracle on many levels. It is one parable that is found in each of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each take a different twist on the same story. While each editor and scribe takes a bit of a twist on the same story, it's clear that Jesus was busy sharing compassion with those that were suffering. What drew the writer to each story? Why was it so pivotal and important? If we are willing to listen, the story will speak for itself. It speaks about Jesus' way in the world. Jesus was not coming from a noble family or a prominent place. Jesus from Nazareth was coming off a boat with no heavenly entourage and confronted with a multitude of people. Jesus shows compassion, working out of himself, working out of himself through a willingness to hear their stories of sickness and meet their story with healing. He leans into their story. I work all day and can hardly feed my family. I cannot go to the temple. The guards beat me and threw me out at the city gates. Jesus meets their sickness and heals them through sharing with each person their human worth to God, a God who loves them and knows them by name, not by where they live or work or by their gender or gender identity or sexual orientation or color of their skin or their accounts or their investments. Jesus comes to heal, making them see for themselves love. They are loved. You are loved no matter what the dominant culture states. You deserve to be fed and nourished and walk away satisfied. There is nothing wrong with seeing the end of the story first. Naturally, that's where we want to start. Who doesn't want to think about feeding five, 4,000 or 5,000, depending on your storyteller? There was a process, though, for Jesus getting to the fishes and loaves. The compassionate process cannot be overlooked. That is why the people stayed. Their sickness, what drew them together to begin with, to cross the lake, to find Jesus, that's what drew them together first. Jesus feeds their human soul first, and he pieces together their shattered hearts and spirits by sharing compassion through action of seeing them not avoiding or condoning or judging or pointing or blaming. You are good as whole. This compassion overflows with reassuring hope. These early four followers were out of hope, and Jesus shares with them a message and a promise that equates to a miracle, to the outcast, to those marginalized by a corrupt power that stole from them their dignity and self-worth. They are fed and given love. It's no surprise that this is the way God works and Jesus continues to feed the multitude. Food is vital to any story. Food is always used as a symbol, as a connector for God. Seems like there is always food of abundance in the scripture. Manna from heaven, God like a good shepherd leading us to water, Jesus breaking bread and sharing the cup. Food grabs our connection it grabs our attention and connects us. It is real and tangible. And that is still true today and needs to become a priority in our families and in our community. Growing up, the table was a place of nourishment for my body and spirit. That is one place that my day stopped and we bowed our heads together in prayer, where I learned how to share and take what I needed, not all that I wanted, where I learned stories. I knew that from the very beginning, the table was important and it had nothing to do with the table. At the age of five, I asked a lot of questions and certainly supplied my share of answers. 
It was 1975, and I was a kindergartner in Jackson, Michigan. One of the distinct honors for my kindergarten class was to be chosen as the line leader by the teacher. You were chosen to be the line leader to gym class, to the assembly hall, to recess, to the buses. And as a kindergartner, I began to form some questions. I asked my parents why the black kids in my class were never chosen to lead the line. I had a turn twice, and I know that everyone in the class, Marcel and Margaret to be specific, were never allowed even a first chance, let alone a second chance. There at the table, my world began to change. It was there that the curtain of time was pulled back, and I didn't want to believe it. It was there that I learned for the first time about drinking fountains and bathrooms for whites and blacks, and certain places and spaces on buses and restaurants were reserved for blacks and for whites to sit, segregated places from schools to housing lines. A year before the 200th anniversary of our country, and I wondered at that table, what kind of place is this? And I knew for some very strange and odd reason at the age of five, I didn't have a way to say, everyone should get a chance to lead the line. I didn't have a way to stop the suffering. Being little comes with big problems. And as, as Robin DiAngelo in her book, White Fragility writes, while, white, while many whites see spaces inhabited by more than a few people of color as undesirable and even dangerous, consider another perspective. I have heard countless people of color describe how painful an experience it was to be one of the only people of color in their schools and neighborhoods. Although many parents of color want the advantages granted by them by attending predominantly white, white schools, they also worry about the stress and even the danger they are putting their children in. Imagine how unsafe white schools, which are so precious to white parents, might appear to parents of color. While I was sitting there thinking of fairness, I never thought about the fear going on in the hearts and the minds of black classmates and their families. And I, am firmly, I firmly believe listening is so key right now. And this is where our true work begins. Schools are designed for learning and growth and acceptance and security. The core premise was challenged for me in 1975. This isn't safe or right. This isn't safe or right. And while changes have taken place since 1975, there is work to be done. I have work to do. I know we need new line leaders today. We need people of color as line leaders in schools and churches and civic and political organizations. We need to reclaim family tables where food is passed and served as places of education and empowerment. This is where everything starts, sitting down together with hands and hearts and feasting. Awareness is vitally important, and that can be frightening to say the least. Healing takes shape with Jesus-like persistence. What do you have? five loaves and two fishes. What does it take? It only took one Jesus and his willingness to take a stand, to make a change. What do I have? What do you have? We are parts of systems and structures that need action today. Healing systemic racism takes persistent works. It takes compassion to see the suffering and it takes action to make change in self community, and country as part of living in pandemic days. We must construct long and wide tables, and maybe today they need to be virtual tables where we can listen to stories. I know that I have talked long enough as a white male with privilege. There are others at the table, people of color who have not had a chance to speak, and now is the time. Traditionally, the first Sunday of the month is communion setting, Sunday. Fitting that we are already take, talking about food. Food and tables seem so simple and yet so challenging right now. As we continue to meet virtually, we long for our physical world. Something that is familiar in an unfamiliar time, something that we can touch and see. These pandemic days are teaching us something else. 
The table that Jesus invites us to remains open when everything seems closed and at risk. The bread and the cup were for each and every one, for Jesus desired healing and grace, and that never stops. And that may in and of itself be a miracle for today. The table is not my table. It does not belong to you either. It's God's table where we are all welcome to receive the best. This is my body broken for you and the cup of salvation poured out for you. Where the courageous see the changes that are necessary in themselves as new line leaders take steps to lead in a new direction. The conversations and conversions around the table are numerous and plentiful and the cost of surrender and awareness building takes a tremendous willingness to listen, to stop and heal the sickness that keep people excluded and not included. We end where we begin. Jesus showed compassion, healed their sickness, and they went away fed. Amen. Thank you for joining in worship today. As we begin our journey into the week, may we find ways to share compassion with others. May we find ways to be that healing balm through listening, through learning, and expanding the voices at the table. May we be nourished and fed by a Jesus who walks with us and challenges us to create working together as a new possibility. Thanks be to God. Amen.